Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the bullpen. In the bullpen today, we have Miss Sarah Montalbano, commentator Young Voices, extensive background. She writes for a wide range of outlets, including the Wall Street Journal, townhall.com, and the Washington Examiner. She has been featured in many, many places. Very smart person, data driven individual. Good to have you on the program. How are you? I'm well, how are you? I'm doing quite well. So we may actually agree on some of these items, but I don't want to presume what you know or believe about our topic. We're talking about COVID protocols, specifically on college campuses. What are your thoughts about it? And then I will respond. Yeah, so I largely think that the costs of most COVID protocols outweigh the benefits conferred on the students, the faculty, and the wider community. College students, first of all, are typically of the age group least likely to experience hospitalization or death. And that appears to be especially true for the new Omicron variant. Um, further, the masking and testing policies of some fully vaccinated campuses are stricter than the CDC's own guidance. Um, and meanwhile, the costs to students are severe. The pandemic is incredibly isolating and that's difficult for college students. And many are going into debt for an education that isn't preparing them for work anymore. We need to focus our resources directly on protecting the vulnerable, such as through contact tracing. And we need to prioritize students getting the quality of education and the experience that they're paying for. I really don't believe that most COVID protocols support that. You know, I'm actually a college professor. I'm for colleges making this decision based on their independent observation of the science. So I may agree with you that it should not be the same for every institution. It should be an interpretation of the science available to them for their local region, which by the way, that's how most science actually comes in, is regional. So that's number one. So you and I may have a little light that we connect to in that. But I do disagree with you on the on the proclamation about the students are basically in a low risk to no risk category. And the reason why I bring this to your doorstep is because we keep talking about COVID as if it is a personal or individual health issue. It is not, it is a public health crisis. If this was an individual health issue, I will completely concur with the summation of your argument. But because it is in fact a public health crisis, that means that we have to look at how the individual impacts others, not just what happens on the silo of a campus, but in the ecosystem of society. Because no student exists in a vacuum. They talk to people, they interact with family members, they have jobs, they have workspaces. They are part of the healthcare conversation as a public health issue, not an individual health concern. And to your other point about quality of curriculum, a quality of education, you will have winners and losers no matter how this turns out, it's unfortunate, but it's a reality. One of the things we had to do early when COVID first hit, literally the colleges that I teach and lecture at, they had to either train professors on how to deliver online curriculum properly, or number two, they had to pay them out to hire professors who could teach online because everybody, even law schools that are prohibited by the ABA, went online for one year, the ABA gave them a waiver so they could do online curriculum, right? So I get it, but at the same time, there's this evolving of curriculum. And, and let me bring to your attention a couple of programs that were forced to go online, but they, they're ranked number one, not number one online. Morehouse School of Medicine, they have the number one ranked Master of Biotechnology. They have the number one ranked health informatics program in the United States of America. That program is 100% virtual delivery. They're not ranked based on online delivery. They beat John Hopkins University and all of their curriculum is online. So there's obviously ways to do this without compromising the integrity of their education, nor the health conversation about this being a public health crisis. Would you not agree? I do agree with that. And I think there's a large difference between classes that were meant to be delivered online, which perhaps that course you mentioned is or was designed with the intent of being, and then being shuffled into online classes halfway through March 2020. And, you know, teachers not being ready for it. I had several classes that the professors were 
obviously unprepared and and just tried to lecture and take notes as if it was the same style as an in person classroom. Um, and I think largely the online courses have improved from you know three or four semesters of doing this. Um, but they, I think there is still a large difference between college courses being designed to be delivered online and then being forced into being online uh, through circumstance. You know, and, and as I said earlier, I think colleges need to make this decision based on the local science. Now, let me pose this question to you. If there's a campus that has a positive rate of let's say 15%, should the campus close then? Like when should the campus or when should a class cancel based on how many positive test results you have of COVID? I wouldn't be able to put an exact number to it. Well, I they have do, to, all due sure. respect. They yes. have to, and that the reason why I pose that question to you is because it's easy for us to moralize against their decision when we're not in that particular position. So if you're saying, listen, they're wrong for doing it, there is a public health decision. So they have to make some decision based on a public health dynamic. What would be your qualifier? What percentage would you say, you know what? That percentage, I understand why the school made that call. What would it be? I think 15% is as reasonable as any other number. And I think that percentage needs to be defined in conjunction with local and state health officials. They're an integral part of this, a college can't make that decision in isolation from the larger community. Um, and I think colleges do have the potential to be really hot spots of activity, um, especially within the first few weeks of the semester when all the students are converging back on large campuses. Um, but I think contact tracing can largely take control of that or a brief, brief return to online learning. You know, one of the elements from this, and, and listen, I'm an in class professor, okay? I was mad as hell when everybody had to go online because I like the teaching moment. I like being in the classroom. I like seeing the students. I like the back and forth, the banter. It's just an organic connection and, and I'm a real teacher. And I'm okay with teaching with a mask on, with, I don't care. Real teacher can, can get through that stuff. But you had a delivery model and the delivery model was, now you have to deliver through online education. And then they got all of these companies. I've had to learn new systems, it's not Zoom. Cause too many people were crashing it. So they had to create these new systems so that you can deliver education. So I get it on that point. You're not making the argument, however, you're not saying you know no school needs to do this. You're saying, I don't think it should be general, but schools need to make the decision locally. Mm -hmm. I definitely agree with that. I think it's really a situation of circumstance in your local community okay. and what kind of hospitals you have and where their capacity is. Um, but I think it's a real shame for students who are paying. I mean, quite frankly, my difficulty with this is that students are still paying full price tuition for maybe an education that's not suiting them that well. And is that being very unpredictable and they aren't getting the in-person experience that many of them are explicitly signing up for. You know, I actually agree with that wholeheartedly. I was part of a movement, still part of a movement of professors who support um, colleges refunding students additional money because they will not benefit from the brick and mortar experience. They will not benefit from the student activity services. They will not benefit from the on campus atmosphere uh, due to the online delivery. Now the pushback to that is, and I get the other side of the argument. The pushback to that is, listen, we basically have the same bill still, right? Because the college has not been able to really translate or transfer their political or their uh, financial reality. It still is what it is. They have to pay for accreditation. They have to pay for their uh, maintenance requirements. They have to pay for whatever the code is for that particular state and city for them to maintain a college campus. So I, I get both sides of the argument. I'm just pro student as it relates to that. Let me bring to your attention um, some colleges that have shut down campuses before COVID or for things other than COVID. Uh, University of Michigan, uh, Rowan University in Glassboro, New Jersey, uh, Florida State University. Uh, these colleges, and this is just a few. These colleges also shut down their campuses, not because of COVID, but because of the flu. And they all have their independent, here's our measure for when too many students are testing positive, we're gonna start canceling class. My point to you is colleges have routinely canceled classes when there has been an outbreak of sorts, even of viruses that literally really won't kill you, okay? Virtually nobody dies from it, some people, rare exception, but virtually nobody dies from it. But they said, listen, this is still a public health issue and they shut down the campus. Why do you think no one complained about those major colleges shutting down 
education and going to a hybrid or online study program. And some of them just decided, hey, we're gonna just cancel class altogether. You'll come back in two or three weeks and we'll just start where we left off. Why don't you think you see you saw the political pushback for those campus shutdowns as you see for the campus shutdowns today? I think the most important point to that is that people knew that the flu was going to end, that there was a flu season mm. every year and that was going to stop. I think what I what I have problems with is the fact that universities have given no indication anymore of when restrictions might be lifted. They tried to in the fall. But and you know they don't know, Sarah. No, but once again, I know. We're, we're back to a really practical element. You Absolutely. know, people say, uh, follow the science, right? And they say science is a fact. and. I always have to correct that notion, science is not a fact. Science is an observation. And when you say, is it scientific? That means does it follow the field of study based on observation? That's what science is. So literally these college professors and these boards, the board of trustees, they're making a decision based on the current science or the current data that's available, that's scientific. That's following the science, that's how this works. So when you say, or when you criticize them for not having an end in sight, well, the observation of the science won't allow them to have an end in sight. If they were to arbitrarily say something like, you know what, Sarah, no matter what, we're gonna have class started next week. We don't give a damn what the increase of Omicron or any other variant that may come is. That would be irresponsible, would it not? I think generally it would be. Yeah. I think there is, um, the consideration that we're seeing with the early data about Omicron is that it may be becoming endemic. And then that mm. certainly has its own costs. That's right. Um, but the early evidence suggests that it's more infectious but less severe, especially on college campuses where everybody is, in, is vaccinated. Over 800 colleges and universities are requiring vaccinations. And that's also another part of my problem is that vaccination was supposed to be this situation where college could finally go back to normal if you just get vaccinated. And I think that's incredibly demoralizing. You know, you don't have any issue with the vaccinations, right? No. Okay, that's good because colleges have always required us to be vaccinated. <laughs> no matter sure. what, we've had a list of vaccinations. I always have to show my vaccination passport every time I teach at a new college. Every time I lecture at a new college, I have to show them I have these particular vaccinations that you require. This was pre COVID-19. Um, I think some of your issue is legitimate, but it's more so connected to the reality of a healthcare crisis. We've never had a healthcare crisis like this in our lifetime. So some of the answers that you're seeking simply are not available. Uh, they, they, they're just not there, at least not yet, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree with that. And I would even amend your definition of science, if you don't mind. Sure. Is that I think of science as a process. And we are going through this process as an entire mm -hmm. society where we are trying to figure out what is the truth about this disease. And that keeps changing as much as we are moving. Yeah. Uh, what I am observing here is that that's incredibly difficult, first of all, for college students to plan around. Uh, we've seen a drop in enrollment in the last two years as students have deferred entering college for the pandemic, during the pandemic. Um, and then there's the fact that it's just not reasonable for most students to you know, take on a lot of debt and then drop out without finishing their degree if they don't like these restrictions. Yeah, one of the things I think colleges should really consider is learning how to create hybrid, hybrid programs. And here's why I say that, according to Inside Higher Ed, hybrid programs are much more effective at student retention than just online study, okay? The other part of this conversation is the reality that it exposed the inequity involved in the delivery of higher education. And people in my community, they were severely impacted by this because there was a technology divide. There was a technology gap that pre-existed COVID that we never got a handle on. And because of that technology divide, when you all of a sudden tell up and coming college students, you have to have these technologies in order to get educated, what happened? Immediately those who are historically disenfranchised, they're out of the pie, they're out of the loop, right? So we have to be very aware of the inequity that it exposed. I'm a solutions guy, I want solutions for these things, right? So I'm willing to point it out, the left and the right, they have been non-effective at making sure these inequities um, have vanished uh, from our historically marginalized communities. So what would you say to that dynamic? That if you're going to do this for colleges, if you're going to do online study or hybrid study, 
even in the interim. What's your responsibility to make sure students can get the uh, the curriculum delivered to them in an appropriate way, even if they have a digital divide taking place in their local community? That's a difficult problem to solve, and I, yeah. I'm not going to pretend like I'm the most qualified to solve it. Um, but I think what's most important is the campus keeping their resources open, you know, keeping their library and computer labs as open as possible, maybe reserving space so that you're not, you know, not physically distanced. Um, and I think what I think my university's done and several others, uh, many others are allowing technology checkouts to take it home. Um, you know, take laptops home if you have internet and if you don't have internet, come to the library. Um, and I think there's a lot of things the community can do too in public library space. Yeah, and it definitely has to be holistic, right? You can't just Absolutely. piecemeal this thing. Uh, one of the positives, if, if there is a silver lining here, one of the positives, and this is based on recent data, it was published a few weeks ago. Online course completion significantly improved the chances of a student earning a degree. For each additional unit of successful online study, the odds of degree completion nearly doubled. And you have more people entering into degree fields because of the online delivery. That's not to negate the reality of the other side of the coin, which means that roughly 25% of students also said we were not ready for the technology requirement of pure online studies. So we have some work to do here. My point, my ultimate point to you is these colleges, the presidents, the boards that are making the decision to either do hybrid or go virtual, they have to make that decision based on a public health interpretation of the science, right? Certainly. Certainly. Yeah, and I, I would say that there's a that colleges need to be upfront about the possibility of going into the remote learning. Uh, that was really a shock in 2020, and I think you know a lot of us are, are a little scarred by the promises made last semester, and then the potential that it would happen again. Um, and I, I have no problem at all with online courses. I think online courses can be really great for people, especially if they have other family sure. obligations or you know responsibilities outside of school. Um, but I think in general, a lot of students didn't learn as much. Um, in that you know it maybe you were getting more busy work, maybe it was more difficult to concentrate because you're in an environment that isn't conducive to learning. Well, we're in the middle of a public health crisis, Sarah. Absolutely, uh, that, that's the reality, and I feel that you're putting a lot of the emphasis or the, a lot of the blame on colleges who are just as in the dark as you and me as far as what would end up happening. And they can't make decisions arbitrarily that don't take into account the, the current data. And my first year in law school, I mean, my first year in law school was during the first COVID, right? The one where everybody was terrified. And I remember getting that email from the institution uh, that we're going to have to do classes on Zoom. I said, wait a minute, Zoom? Now, law school is already tough enough. You still gotta pass the same test, no matter how you get the information. So I wasn't happy about that, but I understood it's not their fault, right? They have to still get this information to us somehow. And we definitely need to make sure we recruit professors, train professors, that, that can reach students where they are. Let me tell you what I did as a professor. And I wanna know your feelings about this. I had two students that didn't have adequate access to the internet, okay? So we used their cell phone. So I taught them on a conference call. I had them call me after class so that they could get what they didn't get during class cause they had choppy internet reception. Nobody taught me to do that. Nobody said, doc, you have to do, that's called differentiated study. I know it cuz I studied it and I understand why it's impactful. We need to recruit those types of leaders in our academic circles, in my opinion. Absolutely, that I, that's incredibly admirable, Dr. Ritchie. Um, it really takes a lot to notice, first of all, that this, these students aren't keeping up, that they haven't been showing up to online classes. Um, and I think a lot of professors have that drive too. Yeah, and then there's some professor Sarah who just say, well, they get it, they get it. If they don't, they don't. Exactly. It's not yeah, good, especially I, this era. Exactly. Now, universities need to take steps to educate their professors about it and make sure they know, okay, if you're not seeing a student, maybe that's for technology issues. Yep, there you go. Mm -hmm. All right, it's been a pleasure. I appreciate you being on the show. Very authentic conversation. Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely.